unionists, but has failed to engage with the day-to-day -day realities of millions of union members and millions of working class people throughout the world, not only in developed nations, but especially in developing nations where people suffer the most. What does this debate come down to? Three questions. First, does the nature of unions allow them to properly represent the interests of workers? Second, do we need unions in the developing world? And final question, what is the current situation in today's world? And what is the role of the union in today's world? So, let's go with this first question. Does the nature of unions allow them to properly represent the interests of workers? And we brought you so many responses that have gone unengaged by Team South Africa. First, we came up with this analysis that unions actually have an interest to save face at all costs. All they need to do is bring a perception that they are tough, that they have a hard stance, and this gives them legitimacy. Why does this give them legitimacy? Because unions have a single job, which is to say, we are going to help people. So what do they do? They take an uninflexible stance in which they never accept a pay cut, because a pay cut directly attempts against their political legitimacy. And what does this mean? It comes at the expense of flexibility. But why is flexibility so important? Because we change, we live in an economic climate that constantly changes. It means that when we are in a recession, it is sometimes necessary in order to take a pay decrease in order if we want to keep the jobs in the first place. And we gave you the example of Fiat, which has gone completely unrefuted by their side. They need to give you this analysis as to why the inflexibility, which is systemic, thank you, sir, in unions has been unable to comply with the interests of workers, whose interests are not to have always the highest wage possible, but to sometimes keep their job over a higher wage. No thanks. Okay. And I'll come down to the, to the next point, which is that of barriers of entry. Because we brought you so many analyses to why people who weren't members of the union were actually harmed, which is also done completely engaged by Team South Africa. But the analysis on the barriers of entry comes to the interests of the existing union members. What does this mean? That when people in the union are, for example, a bad worker, incompetent, old, possibly about to be fired, they have absolutely zero incentive to bring in new people. What is the responsibility of the union to this incompetent worker? To keep his job. That is why it's really hard for people to enter an industry. That is why we have these massive unemployment rates, especially in youth, 40% in Spain in the, develop, in the developed world, ladies and gentlemen, completely unengaged by Team South Africa. If you want to help the youth, if you want to help the young worker, then go with our side, not with you, man. No thing. Okay, then we brought this example about strikes. And what we told you, some people are in very pressing situations. When they actually need to feed their family, they cannot afford to go into strike. And they simply told us, okay, that's simply false. Unions are not abusive. Let me tell you why unions have systemic reasons to be abusive in all cases. Because they need leverage power. And leverage power comes from absolute control of all workers. They need everybody in the industry, in their company, in order not to go to the strike. Because a company can continue to function if, if some people are working. That is why they have great incentives for nobody to work. And what does this mean? That some people will go without food for days. Okay, and now they brought a simple response. Okay, people can, can move into a, to a union, move out, and this sort of creates political pressures for the union to adapt to the interests of people, to which we say it's so false. Why is it so false? Firstly, because as they've conceded, sure. unions are so powerful. So in many cases, they have a monopoly over the employment in industries. And we gave you examples in Mexico, where they actually have instituted codes, sure. where, for example, construction workers, are 70% of construction workers have to be from a union. And I'll take you, Meta. Thank you, Matt. I'll deal with the comparative in my, in my, in my future point, okay, which is about the current situation. So, back to this very important quote about why they can't leave. Firstly, because they have a blackmail, so they have quotas. It means that if you do not belong to a union, you are unemployed because most of the workers, most of the jobs belong to people in the union. And so people can't opt out of these things. That is why unions have a monopoly, and that is why this flexibility does not exist. Sir. No thanks. Okay, so do we need unions in the developing world? Firstly, they come up with this idea that most of the developing world countries are not democracy, which we find disgusting. They also tell us most of the developing countries in the world do not, do not have minimum wages. As a member of Team Peru, as people here from Mexico, Argentina, and Chile, we also find this disgusting, ladies and gentlemen. Our countries are not the puppets of capital of, of capitalist agents. We have functioning electorates where people actually care about workers and their own interests. Do you think that we are stupid and we would vote in favor of a government that will sell itself to an oil company? No. And then they said, okay, but there are autocracies in Africa, to which we say, these autocracies in Africa, some of these, as you have characterized, extreme autocracies, commit genocide. Do you think that simply because somebody goes on strike, this government will have some sort of flexibility? There have been massive riots in Zimbabwe that have not been able to deter the policies of Mugabe. Explain to me why unions in your side of the house would be able to deter strong men like him. No, thank you. But, 
No, they deserve just deny it. <laughs> Point, which they've essentially denied every single harm about why unions are actually hindering jobs in the developing world. We brought you a whole argument on it, about like three minutes of constructive material that has gone completely unengaged. And we gave you very specific examples where essentially the presence of a union meant that a worker had a job or that he didn't have a job. We gave you the example of India. Now in India, the opportunity cost for companies to hire is so big because there is so much inflexibility. Because they cannot fire people, it means that if you hire somebody that's incompetent, you cannot fire him, you are stuck with him. As a result, companies are reluctant to hire, which means that unemployment rates are systemically so high in India simply because there are this huge reluctance to hire people. They've been unable to engage with this beyond a response to a POI that simply said, okay, well, it's good that they care about the rights of the workers. Okay, sure, maybe they care about the rights of the workers in the unions, but this is largely irrelevant when most of the people are unemployed. No response to our analysis we just brought up in, 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 sure. in the constructive material. No, thank you, sir. So, let's go to this last clash, which essentially deals with why we have existing mechanisms, alternatives in our system, in our status quo, in order to deal with the rights of workers and the interests of workers. So, what is the current situation? First, we'd like to reject the conception that we live in the oppressive capitalist society that they'd like us to believe. I'm sorry, but we do not live in these uh, societies. Even the United States, these those vital capitalist states, I'm sorry, have some things such as the NBC, for example. Things that actually protect the interests of workers. Despite the existence of Fox News, they have so much interest in protect the workers. So, what does this prove? That we have functioning democracies. That we have electorates that are actually responsive to what the government does. And these electorates care about workers. These are not mindless people with absolutely no empathy. These people care about workers. So if you have some sort of massive abuse, these people will vote in favor of the governments that, that, that protect these workers' rights. But more importantly, we have a more flexible media. Now, media before did not go out against the big corporations. Now we think we have big incentives, in order if you want to sell your story, to prove that there have been systemic harms to people. These things sell, these are things are new, and the media is not controlled by these large corporations, so they're able to assert when there have been abuses. More importantly, we have NGOs, and we have things such as, for example, like citizen super PACs. So people are able to use their funds in a different way in order to protect their own interests against other lobbies and stuff like that. So democracies are functional. That's our basic answer. And if you don't want to deny it, well, you better present a better argument. And we also have things, for example, such as, such as popular pressure, boycotts. If a company is ex exceptionally exploitative, you can boycott their product. Media will probably, you know, some of these people have using sweatshops, they're using children. We're like, we don't want that, and you still buying the product. So mechanisms exist in the status quo as to why unions can be easily replaced by existing unions. What have we shown you today? First, unions are inflexible and do not protect the actual interests of the workers and workers in general in a country. Second, that unions are naturally relevant in the developing world and we need to abolish them in order if we want to have more employment and if we want to have workers that are better off. And finally, that there are existing alternatives in the status quo that allow us to represent the interests of workers. And for all these reasons, please vote for Proposition. <laughs>